Hello, welcome to our webinar on Abortion 101, History, Healthcare, and Politics in the United States. We're happy to have you joining us today. My name is Betsy Winter. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the Director of Community Support for Return to Zero Hope. And before we start, I'd love to just share a little bit of information with you about our organization. Our mission at Return to Zero Hope is to engage a global community of bereaved parents and their health providers to improve mental health outcomes while also advancing pregnancy and infant loss awareness, education, and support. And at Return to Zero Hope, we serve bereaved families through direct services, such as our virtual support groups, workshops, and our in-person retreats. We also provide online resources and education. And additionally, we provide resources, trainings, and support to the providers who interface with the bereaved parents throughout their journey of love and loss. Today's webinar is the second webinar um, in a three-part series. So the first webinar is live on our YouTube channel, if you missed that one. Highly recommend watching. And today we're going to continue this important conversation about terminations for medical reasons and abortion in a post row United States. We recognize the significant and traumatizing impact that politics, law, religion, and culture have on individuals and families needing access to reproductive health care specifically abortions and terminations for medical reasons. And at Return to Zero Hope, we are committed to creating spaces and providing resources that honor the diversity of humanity and all forms of loss experienced during our pregnancy or parenthood journeys. And today I'm always excited to introduce our lovely Jane Armstrong who will be presenting today and will be presenting um, the final session for this series as well. Jane is a TFMR mom, native Texan and clinical social worker certified in perinatal mental health. Following the birth and death of her first child, Frankie, through termination for medical reason, Jane opened both and therapy to provide individual therapy and support groups to other TFMR parents. These services aim to support parents through the unique barriers of grief of ending a one pregnancy, particularly in the state of Texas, where such care is no longer accessible. She's passionate about building community, eliminating shame, and honoring grief for TFMR families. And we're really honored to have her here. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jane Armstrong. Thank you, Jane. Thank you so much for that introduction, Betsy. I'm thrilled to be here and uh, digging into a different facet of this topic today. Uh, this is um, uh, going down to some foundational information about abortion in the United States, particularly in the post Roe society we find ourselves uh, in now. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to share this topic uh, with uh, the folks who are here today and anybody watching the recording later, because this is a really nuanced topic and it's one that is uh, often full of stigma and often silenced um, or given um, for misinformation. So um, to start off and expand just a little bit on the intro that uh, Betsy shared, um, uh, my name is Jane, I use pronouns she, her. Um, my TFMR uh, experience with my son Frankie, it took um, some time for me to recognize my experience as uh, as an abortion, despite the fact that he uh, was born and died via a d &E at a Planned Parenthood. It just felt very much like my loss was not something I had heard really talked about in the abortion debate before. Um, and it took a lot of work to turn inward and find out 
where that resistance was coming from or what were the stories I was telling myself about abortion or about my loss um, and really digging into um, uh, some of those core beliefs and uh, their origins, which I'm going to hopefully get uh, all of us to look at a little more closely today as well. Uh, I know for many folks who uh, have been through a termination for medical reasons, they may have had very uh, clear ideas for themselves uh, around what abortion was or what it meant. Um, and growing up, I was always somebody who uh, was raised by a mom who was a feminist and starting law school shortly after Roe v. Wade was passed uh, through the Supreme Court. Um, so that was always something that was part of my experience and uh, something that I found really valuable uh, about myself to identify as pro-choice. Um, that might have looked like how I voted or donated money or uh, protested. Um, I was very proud to participate in uh, the People's Filibuster with State Senator Wendy Davis in 2013. Um, and uh, through my loss experience, through meeting and supporting other TFMR parents and learning more about abortion and access to care in the United States, my the way I've identified has shifted and I now consider myself pro-abortion, which may not be a very popular um, identifier and may bring up, even in you listening, some uh, physical responses or discomfort. Um, but I find that um, this language element is really important and gonna be one of the first things we dig into today. So to give you an idea of what to expect, um, we're gonna start out by defining our terms and including the origins and evolution of the language surrounding abortion in the United States. We're going to dig in a bit to some common myths and rhetoric used uh, in the abortion debate in the US, discuss facts that they are used to obscure. Um, and we'll also go into um, uh, as part of this look at definitions and language, uh, we'll also explore some of the um, uh, different methods of abortions there are out there. Then we will um, go into some of the history, timeline, and politics, looking at how did we get where we are today um, and, and giving that context for uh, today's climate and environment. I'll share at the end some relevant resources just to beef up your toolbox so that you can support yourself or others to understand your rights and the law, um, what sources or information you can trust, and uh, how to avoid uh, dangerous or um, uh, misinformation that may be out there. Okay. With this agenda in mind, I'd like to ask everybody participating in this webinar, whether live or recorded, just to take three deep cleansing breaths before we dive in. Um, this is just a way to kind of pull us into the moment, accept that this may be an uncomfortable topic and uh, remain open to uh, whatever comes up throughout the presentation. So as you're comfortable, just three deep breaths in and out. bringing yourself into your body in the present. And allowing yourself to be open to anything that may come up or challenge you during this presentation. Thank you so much. All right, we are gonna dive in. All right, so first things first, what is abortion? Um, you probably have an idea of what this means to you. Um, and the answer to this question may be more complicated than it seems. Um, definitions uh, that one may come across vary widely based on the source, the audience, uh, and the agenda of the person or institution defining the term. Um, 
for many in the U.S. who've witnessed this public and political debate surrounding abortion here, the word may bring to mind a carefully curated set of specific circumstances or images, which may include things like an unwanted, unplanned, or unintended pregnancy, uh, shame, silence, violence, fear. Um, this context can also cause strong reactions in patients who have experienced pregnancy loss and or had abortions. Um, looking at clinical terminology in their chart, especially if they carry some internalized bias um, or if the term does not align with how they define their experience for themselves. So what this can look like um, is somebody who's had a miscarriage can see a term spontaneous abortion in their chart and they might be really taken aback by that uh, or feel defensive or a need to justify that their experience was not something that they chose or uh, elected to happen. Um, there can also be a, a term for parents who have been through a termination for medical reasons. They may see an induced abortion uh, in their medical chart. Again, even just the term abortion may feel like it doesn't jive with their definition of their own experiences. Um, but the medical term, looking all the way back at how it's been used historically, just refers to the ending of a, the medical condition of pregnancy other than with a healthy life birth. Um, so that's why you may see spontaneous abortion in someone's chart referring to a miscarriage. Um, for our purposes today, we're going to uh, use the term abortion to refer to medical intervention that involves ending a pregnancy with the intent or expectation that the baby or fetus will not survive. This is not necessarily a perfect definition. Um, and as we dig into this topic more, expect to see the challenge of effectively and inclusively encapsulating the wide range of abortion experiences. Okay, so thinking about definitions and language, what are some factors that impact how most Americans understand or define abortion today? Um, looking at inflammatory, politically motivated rhetoric and action, there are so many uh, charged, fake, and effective buzzwords out there around uh, the abortion debate. The example I like to use in this contrast is uh, looking at the phrase abortion is murder and the phrase abortion is health care. These are two phrases you'll see commonly on opposing ends of the spectrum of uh, the abortion debate. Um, the word murder brings up a lot of strong emotional responses in people in a way that the word healthcare, though more nuanced, though more true, uh, doesn't. So when we look at um, the way language and definitions show up, I think it's really important to recognize the impact that the black and white um, uh, rhetoric or um, uh, political motivation or action uh, can from the uh, anti-abortion side compared to possibly a more nuanced, more inclusive, more compassionate uh, language that you may see in folks who are trying to expand and protect access to abortion. Um, clinics, medical care, pregnancy outcomes can sometimes be shrouded in mystery, confusion, or even criminalization. Um, so thinking about just where you live, do you know where the closest place is to you where abortion care is available? Um, it may not be something that folks think about, but it's not really something you have to think about for most other medical care. Um, do you know what happens during an abortion procedure? Uh, you've likely seen stories in the news about, uh, criminalization of pregnancy outcomes. We have uh, 
Brittany Watts in Ohio recently, who a grand jury declined to indict um, following a miscarriage she experienced at home. Uh, we also have um, in the New York Times recently a story about uh, a fellow Texan, uh, Jennifer Alvarez Estrada Glick, who uh, died. And there are many questions now wondering if she had been counseled on the option to end her pregnancy if she might still be alive. Um, so we look at the way these mysterious or confusing uh, laws and attitudes out there about abortion have very real, sometimes lethal impact. Um, we also have things like crisis pregnancy centers um, where uh, plentiful, well-funded and cleverly disguised misinformation and fake clinics uh, can um, really thrive often with a lot of taxpayer money. Um, crisis pregnancy centers often look like real health centers, which is by design, um, but they don't actually practice medicine. They may offer services such as uh, pregnancy or STI testing or ultrasounds, uh, but because they are not medical facilities, they are not required to comply with HIPAA, which is all about keeping your information private. Um, and that opens up a lot of really frightening things where you think about what if they shared your information with um, an anti-abortion lobby who then knew your name, knew where you lived, or sent you really targeted messages uh, about abortion or your own healthcare decisions. Um, one way you can often spot a fake clinic is, is if they advertise offering free pregnancy tests uh, abortion counseling or education, et cetera, but refuse to help you get an abortion or provide other practical support, such as condoms or effective birth control methods. Then we also have a lot of fear. With all of this out there, um, impacting the way we talk about abortion and understand it, how do you know who to trust or who do you believe? Um, where do you find reliable, accurate, and compassionate information? So we're gonna start with the language and then zoom out from there. Looking at clinically accurate language, uh, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, or ACOG for short, um, actually has a guide available uh, looking at um, language that is medically appropriate, clinically accurate and without bias. Um, this uh, uh, offers an alternative to a lot of the language you may see repeated in the press uh, and that you've likely used in discussing the topic of abortion yourself uh, that is not medically appropriate, clinically accurate, or certainly not without bias at times. Um, you can see this quote here from the guide. Um, talking about the language that's in the zeitgeist often has a basis in anti-choice rhetoric. Many common words and phrases come from an anti-abortion um, uh, slant, uh, typically can be propaganda designed to vilify, frighten, and isolate people who need abortions and the people who may love and support those people. Um, it's also worthy to note that just because language is clinically accurate, it may or may not be language that patients themselves identify with. If someone has had abortions, they may or may not identify with some of the language that ACOG suggests. And that's okay. Uh, this isn't a mandate for how someone identifies or um, talks about their own experience. This is really looking at um, how things can be maybe reported in media or in the uh, research literature that's out there. I wanted to share some of um, uh, this language guide because I think it's, um, it's really incisive and uh, interesting to hear uh, their justification for some of these things. Um, 
I have um, links to this here that um, I will find a way to share. Uh, possibly we can put them in the notes of the webinar. Um, but there's a website where all this information is, as well as a PDF that you can download uh, to have a look at these. So first one, this is one of my favorites, um, late-term abortion. This is something you often see reported in the press using this term. Um, ACOG notes, this phrase has no clinical or medical significance. Uh, the idea of term historically referred to the three weeks before and two weeks after a pregnancy's due date. To be even more clinically accurate, ACOG now refers to early term as 37 weeks through 38 weeks and six days of gestation. Then you have full term um, and late term, which again is what you see here. Late term would be 41 weeks to 41 weeks and six days of gestation. There's also a post term for 42 weeks and over. Um, they are very clear that abortion does not happen in this period. Uh, so they suggest using instead uh, abortion later in pregnancy or referencing weeks of gestation. So abortion at 15 weeks, abortion at 22 weeks, that sort of thing. Um, but this is designed to conjure a very specific image. Um, heartbeat bill, this is one that was unfortunately very popular before, during, and since Roe was overturned. Um, they suggest gestational age bans, or again, identifying by gestational age. Um, but they say it is clinically inaccurate to use the word heartbeat to describe the sound that can be heard on ultrasound in very early pregnancy. Uh, in fact, there are no chambers of the heart developed at the early stage in pregnancy that these bills are used to target. So there is no recognizable heartbeat. What pregnant people may hear is the ultrasound machine translating electronic impulses that signify fetal cardiac activity into the sound that we recognize as a heartbeat. So again, this is just going through what our doctors understand and making sure that we have that information and that this language is used to uh, uh, enlighten what's really going on or um, eliminate some of the emotional impact that may be used in some of these other terms. Same thing with this term of elective abortion. Um, we have a couple others. Um, you've possibly seen a lot of things about self-managed abortion or abortion medications. Um, you'll sometimes see self-induced abortion uh, coming from uh, the anti-abortion rhetoric. Um, and uh, abortion on demand, which um, again is just really abortion. This is uh, what ACOG says is referring to it in this way is dismissive of the medical needs of pregnant people. Uh, abortion is a medical intervention provided to individuals who need to end the medical condition of pregnancy. Um, I really appreciate that terminology because it is much more straightforward perhaps than uh, some of these emotionally charged options uh, that we do see pretty regularly. So continuing kind of our baseline understanding and definitions, what is involved in an abortion? What can it look like? Um, as with those last slides and these ones coming up, I am not a doctor. The information you see here is distilled from medical sources, uh, but please don't interpret this from me as um, medical advice or interpretation. All right, so um, uh, there are um, two main forms of abortion that you'll see discussed uh, and out there available. The first is medication abortion, sometimes called the abortion pill. Um, this is different than plan B or emergency contraception. Um, sometimes in uh, the press, you'll see the two conflated. Um, the uh, uh, Medication abortion consists of using two different medicines, uh, mifepristone and misoprostol, 
uh, to end a pregnancy. They cause cramping and bleeding to empty the uterus. Um, for some folks, this might feel like a very heavy or crampy period or uh, feel similar to an early miscarriage. Um, this is available um, and approved up to 11 weeks after the first day of your last period. So that's how we track gestational age. Um, you may also be prescribed some antibiotics to prevent infection. With medication abortion, this may be something that you present in person to receive. It may also be something that you can uh, access via telehealth or through the mail. Um, this, like every other um, abortion option that you may see in the United States is under attack at the moment. Um, so things continue to shift. Um, but moving on to our next option, we have in clinic or surgical abortion. Um, you'll see sometimes a DNC or a dilation and curatage. This is also a common procedure to resolve an incomplete miscarriage or um, uh, other tissues that may need to be removed from a uterus uh, as part of a medical procedure. Um, dilation and ev evacuation or DNE is uh, potentially more common in the second trimester. Both are very common and safe procedures involving some vacuum aspiration. Uh, they may also involve some other tools such as forceps. Um, these are typically pretty brief. Um, uh, they may only last 10 to 20 minutes. Um, depending on gestation and other factors, they may involve uh, some of the uh, same medications that uh, are used in medication abortion to uh, soften and open the cervix. They may also involve placing laminaria to uh, uh, the day before or a couple days before to start that process. Um, it, uh, the surgical or in-clinic options typically involve at least sedation uh, and local anesthesia. Sometimes though, general anesthesia may also be available. Um, and uh, it's worth noting that who may offer uh, these very common, very safe medical procedures may vary widely based on not just the law of where you are, but policies related to hospital systems that may have religious affiliations or doctors trying their best to protect their practices, their licenses, and their livelihoods. Um, I'd just like to mention that um, obstetrics and gynecology is one of the few potentially only medical specialties that is both a medical and a surgical specialty. DNC, DNE are not unusual or um, particularly challenging surgical procedures and theoretically could be very easily accessible. So the fact that there are so many barriers to it um, can be confusing for patients uh, when it is something that possibly their doctor could relatively easily um, provide with the uh, established relationship they have as patient and provider. So expanding on that a bit, these different methods are not equally available. Um, what kind of abortion somebody has is often a function of accessibility to care, uh, more so than a function of their preferences or best interests. Um, uh, we have accessibility limited by so, so many things. Uh, state law, which uh, we've seen, um, I think we're at 14 states now that have banned abortion outright, possibly with some vague or confusing exceptions. Um, but state law can also have gestation limits, um, limit on procedure or method available. Um, where they can take place, et cetera. Um, availability of medical professionals trained or willing to provide care, hospital policies, et cetera. Okay, so with all of this out there, we understand maybe a little bit better about what we're talking about. 
um, with the language we often see used uh, to discuss abortion in the US. Um, how does this impact the stories that we tell ourselves about abortion? Uh, a lot of this has to do with the water the fish are swimming in. So um, many other societal narratives, uh, we are not fully in control of what we absorb. So think white supremacy or patriarchy, um, but we can be intentional about how we unlearn some of these automatic responses. Um, so just turning inward for a second, think about what messages you receive about abortions in our society. Uh, how much of the political, societal, religious, other narratives surrounding abortion have you internalized? Um, and how do these narratives support or conflict with our values? Um, these internalized narratives may feel at odds with our personal or moral beliefs about abortions. Um, these narratives can even surprise you in their durability or their flexibility uh, as time goes on or as you experience life um, in different ways. Um, for example, um, in a couple, one or two places uh, already in this presentation, um, I've used the word abortions, plural, um, that sometimes just that one letter added can cause uh, a reaction in your body if there is um, an emotional attachment or a story that is internalized. Um, so how do we explore these ideas? Exhale Pro Voice is uh, a fabulous resource for folks who have experienced abortions. Um, they offer a free national text line for emotional support um, that's really uh, led by help seekers um, and uh, also available to their allies. They have uh, great after abortion resources on their website, as well as provide trainings to folks who may uh, be supporting or come in contact with folks who have abortions. Um, they also have this fantastic tool um, that can help each of us understand the stories that we hold about abortion and where they may align or conflict uh, with our values, with things that we understand or recognize consciously or things that may be hidden. Um, this is called the Abortion Values Reflection. I have two slides with this. I'm going to linger for a moment. So if you're watching this and you want to grab it, please feel free to take a screenshot, get your phone out and uh, have a look at this. Um, but um, with, thank you, I see a question coming in. I'm going to save it till the end, but feel free to add questions in the chat if you like throughout. I forgot to say that earlier. Okay, so if you have a look at some of these, basically you are asked to rate um, on a scale of strongly or you know disagree to agree. Um, and I think people are often surprised what comes up here because it really looks at different pieces of the story. So for example, um, it starts with affordable abortion services should be available to every person who wants them. How much do you disagree or agree with that statement? That may be um, something that hits a nerve for somebody, but not somebody else. Um, then we get into another uh, item that says there is a limit to how many abortions any one person should have that maybe brings up some more questions for someone who's asking this for the first time. Uh, we also have stuff that uses that language and the emotional impact of language to potentially provoke. So abortion is a form of killing. How much do you agree or disagree with that? We're gonna move over to this, uh, the second half. Um, we have uh, at the top there, people who feel depressed after an abortion already had problems beforehand. How much do you agree or disagree? Um, 
we also have on this uh, page 15 is too young to become a parent. Um, questions about your level of comfort with things like contraception or um, uh, abortion as a response to gender disappointment in a pregnancy. This is just a really uh, useful tool to dig into some of our own experiences and values around abortion and uncover some of that story that we may be carrying with us, either that uh, is really aligned with our values and that we want to foster or that's really in opposition to our values and that we want to actively unlearn. Um, so uh, with this tool, if it's something you would like to uh, do for yourself, just remember that it's really designed to answer from that first instinct or uh, knee-jerk response, not the reasonable pulling back from that stance, but what was that first thought that came into your mind um, so that you can really get that deeper understanding of your own experience. All right. So what is true about abortion? If we have all this misinformation and all of this emotionally and politically charged language out there, um, Number one, abortion is safe. Uh, according to ACOG and many other medical professionals, uh, based on scientific inquiry, abortion is a safe medical procedure. It does not increase the risk of mental health problems and is safer than many common medical and dental procedures. Um, this point about safety, I find really uh particularly important and relevant to folks who are attempting to access care through a number of barriers. Um, my own experience uh, was in a pre-Dobbs, uh, pre-SB8 Texas, and we'll talk about SB8 very briefly a little bit later because we're already short on time and there's too much to talk about. Um, but at the time, there was a paragraph of what was called mandated counseling that was required by Texas law that a nurse had to read to me word for word um, that contained a lot of uh, misinformation and outright lies about the procedure I was about to go through. Um, they had to tell me that a DNA would increase my risk of breast cancer, would increase risk of infertility. Um, uh, there were several items that were pretty blatantly designed to frighten me, um, to isolate me. Um, and although the staff there handled it beautifully, they read through the paragraph that they had to with the context at the beginning of, we're gonna talk about this as soon as I finished reading it. They went through and were clear to say that um, it is not going to increase your risk of breast, breast cancer. It is not a risk to your fertility, but it does potentially interfere directly with patient care and can erode trust between a patient and their doctor or a patient and their government. Um, in terms of safety, though, most notably, I think, is that abortion is typically safer than childbirth. Um, childbirth has a risk of maternal death that is 14 times higher than the risk associated with abortion. That's not to say that um, uh, folks shouldn't be worried about maternal mortality and childbirth. We need to pay more attention to that. Um, so if that's the case, let's not divert so much attention into abortion, which is much safer. Um, abortion is also common. Uh, roughly one in four people uh, in the US who can get pregnant will have at least one abortion in their lifetime. Nearly half of people who have abortions have more than one in their lifetime. And most people who have abortions already are parenting living children. People of all gender identities can have abortions. The research often refers to women, but cisgender women are not the only ones um, who have abortions. 
for transgender, queer, and non-binary people, accessing abortion care may be even more difficult. Um, and then most Americans believe abortion should be legal in all or most cases. Um, according to the extensive research done at the Pew Research Centers, um, uh, they have a document called Public Opinion on Abortion Fact Sheet. Um, they said in 2022, 61% of Americans said abortion should be legal in all or most cases while only 37% said it should be illegal in all or most cases. Um, Pew also noted that this public support for legal abortion did not change much after the Supreme Court overturned the Roe v. Wade decision and that that was a widely unpopular move uh, for the American people. Okay. We're gonna look at some timeline stuff, some of that historical context we talked about before. Um, this is by no means um, uh, including every step or every important uh, change that took place um, in this time frame since Roe v. Wade, uh, which passed about 50, or, uh, which was decided 51 years ago. Um, just like the slides where I said, I'm not a doctor, I'm gonna sh pop in and remind you, I'm also not a lawyer. Uh, so this is not um, legal advice or interpretation. Uh, this is really consolidating information from um, resources that do have uh, legal knowledge. All right, so first up, January 22nd, 1973, U.S. Supreme Court ruled in a seven to two decision in the case of Roe v. Wade, establishing a constitutional right to privacy that is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. Um, this established a requirement that each state must make abortion legal until the point of fetal viability which at that time was considered to be around 28 weeks or the start of the third trimester. And after that, if the pregnancy poses a threat to the pregnant person's health. Uh, the first and biggest challenge to uh, the new precedent set by Roe was the federal Hyde Amendment. Um, this made it illegal for Medicaid to cover any abortions that were not medically indicated to save the life of the pregnant person. Uh, this has been reaffirmed every year since 1976, with a rape exception being the only change to the ban. Um, this has had the greatest impact on pregnant people of color, resulting in approximately a quarter of pregnant Medicaid users seeking to terminate ending up carrying to term simply because the financial burden is too great. Um, fast forward into the early 90s, we have the Casey decision. This is another SCOTUS case um, uh, that reaffirmed the constitutional right to abortion and created the undue burden framework. Um, this made it more difficult to challenge laws that were less than absolute prohibitions on abortion uh, requiring challenge, challenges to show that a law has the purpose or effect of placing a substantial obstacle in the path of a patient seeking an abortion. Um, this case really opened up the door wide open for state politicians to pass numerous medically unnecessary abortion restrictions all across the country, which courts have ruled do not impose an undue burden. Um, so that's when we started to see um, uh, more and more ground being lost back to that baseline that Roe v. Wade established. Bringing us into the knots, um, Gonzalez versus Carhartt and uh, versus Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Um, this is the first time that the Supreme Court upheld federal legislation to criminalize abortion. So this allowed Congress to ban certain uh, second trimester abortion procedures. Um, it did not um, contain an exception for pregnant patients' health. 
um, effectively overruling a key component of Roe v. Wade, that the patient's health must be of paramount concern in laws that restrict abortion. And we're seeing um, a lot of impact from that first shift in this case in 2007 in a lot of the laws uh, on the books today. Then uh, back to the Dobbs decision in which uh, the current Supreme Court ruled that there is no constitutional right to abortion, reversing almost 50 years of precedent and overturning Roe v. Wade, uh, paving the way for many states to ban abortion entirely or impose further restrictions. Um, this was a case that involved a challenge to a Mississippi abortion ban at 15 weeks of pregnancy um, and uh, leaving us today with hundreds of new laws that have gone into effect all over the country. Um, uh, like I said, I think we're at 14 states right now that have uh, have outright bans on abortion. Um, which may or may not have vague or confusing exceptions for uh, the health of the pregnant person. As I said, this is not an all-inclusive timeline or the only things that impacted um, where we are today. Um, some uh, other things to consider, are things like the global gag rule, um, uh, what some of our next steps might be looking at, uh, especially with the um, uh, reversal of Roe v. Wade and that hinging on privacy. Um, you may have seen things in the news talking about how um, uh, other constitutionally uh, protected for now rights, things like access to contraception, same-sex marriage, um, may be at risk following uh, Roe's reversal. With that in mind, Roe v. Wade was always the floor, not the ceiling. Um, Roe v. Wade established a right. It did not establish access. So with the Hyde Amendment, with these other cases that came after it chipping away, uh, just because somebody, say, in my home state of Texas, had the right to an abortion, they may or may not have had access to one for a number of reasons. Um, you may see things out there about codifying Roe, uh, which potentially could have avoided um, this uh, Supreme Court overruling that we're uh, living through now. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that Roe, uh, did not protect everyone who needs abortion. Um, and it really should be the lowest possible way that we can move forward. What we need is much more comprehensive than what Roe offered. Having a look at our context right now, um, the Guttmacher Institute has this fabulous interactive map uh, with up-to-date policies and information showing abortion across all 50 states. Uh, you can see that kind of deep maroon red is taking up a pretty big swath of the country, particularly concentrated in the South. Uh, but we also have some uh, protective all the way up to most protective states in other parts of the country. And what we have also seen is that uh, many states where abortion has been on the ballot, it has um, uh, overwhelmingly brought people out to vote to protect access to abortion. Um, this map also includes demographic data, abortion statistics for each state, as well as some context for what these restrictive or protective laws look like. Um, some of the statistics that they provide uh, can also be really interesting to look at that question of uh, right versus access. Um, they include average one-way driving distance to the nearest clinic for an abortion um, prior to 15 weeks and after 24 weeks. So for example, the last time I looked at the map for Texas, my home state, um, 
average one way driving distance to the nearest clinic for abortion prior to 15 weeks was 515 miles. After 24 weeks, it was 787 miles one way. Um, Texas uh, spent almost a year before the Dobbs decision living in effectively a post row landscape due to Senate Bill 8 or SB 8, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, I won't go into this too much because we're, I know, running close to the end of our time here. But um, uh, this bill, as well as uh, restricting abortion access, also um, uh, opened the possibility for folks to, folks living anywhere, to sue any abortion provider or anybody else who aided or abetted an illegal abortion in Texas. Um, this was a case that the Supreme Court could have taken up and declined, which meant that it went into effect with no barrier, um, even though it was in opposition to um, precedent set by Roe, which was still in effect at the time. Um, you can see some figures here from the Texas Policy Evaluation Project, which uh, does a lot of research into abortion, particularly in Texas. Um, but uh, this is one of those laws that has been uh, mimicked throughout the country. And um, there are several issues with this law, not least of all the um, uh, civil suit that somebody could bring. Um, but the foundation of the entire law also rests in um, uh, the heartbeat bill idea that we saw way back in that uh, ACOG language guide. Um, RTZ Hope works with folks who have been through all kinds of pregnancy and infant and child loss. I think so many lost parents understand intimately that a heartbeat discovered in pregnancy or fetal cardiac activity or electrical impulses moving through cells, whatever um, makes the most sense for you and your understanding, that doesn't guarantee a healthy living baby. And um, for, uh, I, I like to read some language from this law that uh, really keys into this issue. Um, it asserts that, quote, fetal heartbeat has become a key medical predictor that an unborn child will reach live birth, end quote, and that pregnant people should be informed about, quote, the likelihood of an unborn child surviving to full-term birth based on the presence of cardiac activity, end quote. So this is directly from the language of the law. Um, and for anyone who has lost a baby for any reason and at any stage, this is a particularly insulting and manipulative stance. Um, all right, some uh, resources I'd love to share with y'all. Um, some things there about spotting crisis pregnancy centers or fake clinics. Um, as I said before, these often receive a lot of money from the government, particularly in conservative states or states where um, there are laws or active lobbying to create laws to limit abortions. Um, these can be really helpful in uh, uh, giving you some context for how to judge or what to look for if um, uh, you are looking for either true medical care, looking for abortion care, or just wanting to steer clear of um, uh, these fake clinics. If you're wanting to learn more in the research, uh, just what's in the literature about abortion, about attitudes and understanding around abortion, uh, I mentioned the Guttmacher Institute. They have so, so many fabulous resources on top of um, that interactive map. Uh, the Pew Research Center, which I pulled from in this presentation, as well as the Texas Policy Evaluation Project, um, they have some really um, approachable and straightforward uh, resources there. 
And if you want to know more about uh, the law, if you are needing legal support or representation, or you're wanting to follow some of the um, cases moving through the courts, uh, If When How is a fabulous uh, resource um, where, uh, among other things, they have uh, resources really uh, putting into lay people terms what some of the laws mean and how folks uh, can interact with them um, legally and uh, protect themselves. Um, they also have the Repro Legal Helpline, which is uh, fantastic for folks who are looking for insight or uh, uh, needing legal guidance around uh, abortion. Center for Reproductive Rights is another uh, great one to follow and keep an eye on. Um, they are the folks representing um, folks here in Texas, as well as several other states, both patients and uh, medical professionals who have been impacted by bans on abortions. Um, and particularly in states like Texas, seeking clarity uh, around the exceptions that are uh, listed in law, but not necessarily easily accessed, understood, or uh, effective in practice. There's also uh, pregnancy justice, which can be a great resource. And then if you're looking for some how-tos, um, there is uh, Robin Marty's book, Handbook, Handbook for a Post-Row America, The Complete Guide to Abortion Legality, Access, and Practical Support. This uh, was updated in 2021, I think, so before the Dobbs decision, but that update came with the understanding that Roe was in jeopardy and likely going to be overturned. So uh, this can be a really great resource for somebody who's trying to understand how to navigate things in order to access safe and legal abortions. Uh, it also gives some great context, uh, expanding on what we talked about today in terms of that timeline. Um, so we can go into some Q&A if folks have any questions. Uh, I did see one in the chat that I'm going to pull up. Um, let's see. Um, the question was, you didn't mention early induction as a clinical procedure. Is there a reason for that? I may not understand. Not particularly, Allie. This is really more um, uh, looking at what is most common and in a lot of ways, um, things that may or may not overlap with uh, termination for medical reasons, uh, patients. Certainly, um, uh, early induction can be one way that um, pregnancies are ended and that uh, uh, it can be a form of, of abortions, uh, particularly later in pregnancy where uh, a surgical option may not be recommended anymore. Um, where that is available is more and more limited. Um, and really for the purpose of this webinar as a 101, um, a lot of stuff had to get edited out, but I really appreciate that question. Uh, because it is one of the uh, forms of abortion that's out there, uh, though probably the least common. Um, so thank you for that question. Any others? All right. Well, if there are no more questions, I want to thank you all so much for either tuning in live or watching this later. Uh, I hope it wasn't too breakneck pace trying to squeeze everything in, but uh, this is a really important topic and I'm just so grateful that folks are wanting to learn more about it. Yes, thank you, Jane. Um, we are very lucky to have you out there in the world doing the work you're doing. Thank you. <laughs> like, thank you. See the courage it takes and appreciate this a great deal. And that was very educational, very informative, a lot to digest. And I hope people will come join you for part three, which will be February yes. 16th, Friday, February 16th at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That will be up on our webinar page on our website. So 
If you'd like to learn more, please join us for that third and final um, webinar in this series. So thank you, Jane. Lovely to see you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care, y'all. Bye.